controversy trails the abduction of 333 schoolboys in secondary school in Kankara in Katsina State as more reactions emerge from different quarters. And the PDP gives a green light to former President Goodluck Jonathan to contest in 2023 and it says it has not zoned the seat. This S plus politics. I am Coyote Ladendi. Welcome back and let's get talking to the first issue of the day. Over 300 school boys were declared missing from a secondary school in Kankara Katsina State after being attacked by gunmen. Attackers on motorcycles stormed the all-boys government science school on Friday and engaged security forces in a fierce gun battle forcing hundreds of students to flee and hide in the surrounding forest. The governor of the state, Aminu Meseri, has stated that about 333 pupils were unaccounted for. Meanwhile, family members gathered at the school later on, pleading to authorities to bring the missing boys to safety. And once again, Northern elders asked for the sack of the security chiefs while responding to this development. Joining us to give us a deeper perspective to this is Dr. Ona Ehomu, a security consultant. Good evening, Dr. Ehomu. Good evening, sir. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to have you, even though we are discussing something that is not exciting. But I hope that uh, after this conversation, right steps will be taken, right counsel will be given so I'm so optimistic. So let's look at um, these again. I know you say the way it is. What exactly um, it could, 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 could uh, cause this huge number of schoolboys being attacked? And from the report, this operation took more than an hour. We understand that there's even a military roadblock not far away from the school. What is it that we don't understand, if you can help us throw more light? Thank you very much. I think the central point here is a capable guardianship. Hmm. Um, we, we have a situation where uh, the, well, let's start with the school authorities. You have uh, people there uh, running the school, the authorities as it were, and uh, they don't have, they don't seem to have um, an appreciation for what is happening around them. Um, the fact that uh, uh, the whole area had been under siege of uh, bandits and kidnappers and seizing people here and there. I think um, uh, they must have been under the false impression that uh, since they were a school, they would not be attacked. But that's, uh, that's counterintuitive. Because if you remember the book, uh, uh, April 14th, uh, 2013, when Boko Haram uh, attacked um, the school uh, in... Um, in Chibok, yeah. and took those girls yeah. away. Um, so you, there's a lot of uh, precedent for that. Even here in Lagos, we've had a lot of school attacks, school kidnaps. But I don't think uh, anywhere in the world, I think this number, the Kankara uh, incident, is uh, a Guinness Book of World Record uh, uh, level uh, because there's nowhere in the world that um, over 500 school pupils have been... Uh, kidnapped simultaneously. Um, well, now, uh, Governor Masari says uh, it's 333 left. Uh, but nowhere in the world has that happened before. And uh, so it's quite unprecedented. And uh, it is quite foreseeable. That is, uh, in fact, what is um, making me very um, sad about this situation. It is a foreseeable uh, threat, uh, the threat of uh, mass kidnapping by these bandits because they have laid whole communities to waste already in their escapades uh, without being challenged. So I think um, 
it's really unfortunate that this happened, but okay. we hope that uh, the authorities will swing into action. And I have called specifically for Governor Masari to adopt the Makama model. Makama was a former CP in uh, Ogun State, who when uh, these same bandits, uh, the headsmen in the forest here in Ogun State between uh, Benin and Sagamu Road near J4 Town in Ogun State, seized um, four redeemed pastors July last year. He took um, a lot of security uh, agents and they walked into the forest. They did what we call a march, a line march. You line up people and they just take every step in. And they went deep into the forest until they encountered them. So I'm from the stories we've gotten from the boys who have been seized or are the ones who, who came back, who were able to escape. They talked about a several hour march, about six, six, seven hour march into the forest. Now, mm. when you are marching a large number of boys like that, mm. it's going to be a slow mm. march. So they haven't really gone that far. Mm. And so we know the director, direction of flight. Uh, the governor needs to go personally to the front, lead people. I'm not saying that he, he needs to enter the bush, but he has to be present at the war front, lead people uh, so that those people will march in there because his presence will energize them and they will do more. Okay. Awesome. Uh, Dr. Ahom, I'm sure you're already telling us the way forward, and this is very um, important at this time. But still trying to diagnose the problem, because I feel it's one of our major issues. It appears the lessons learned from Chibok abduction, that of uh, Dachi girls, seems to have been lost on us. But let's look at um, the idea of bandits having this huge number of people for laymen here, we are beginning to see that could this be Boko Haram coming in the name of bandits? Are bandits not just for, you know, stealing of things rather than abducting people? Um, yes, um, certainly. Uh, this, uh, the security situation we have is um, quite a complex one. It's not as simple as anything looks. Uh, it's just that... Uh, because it's so frequent and, uh, and we, I mean, also because we don't have deep introspection, we just kind of lay everything uh, simply on the floor and just say, oh, they are all bandits. I mean, what does that mean? It doesn't make what they are doing um, legitimate. Um, so, but let me, let's try to deconstruct this very situation. Now, I wrote a book recently where I talked about uh, the book of Aram Threat. And the fact that that threat has metastasized, that means the threat has gone afield into the country, all the way to the southwest right here, into even Lagos here. The threat has spread beyond just the northeast. Now, they don't have the kind of resourcing or the kind of power they have in the northeast to carry out the kind of brazen attacks. But they have linked up with other elements. You have uh, the... Uh, criminal Fulani young men who are in the bush who say they don't have cattle anymore, so they have to engage in crime. You have the jihadists coming from Mali, from Burkina Faso, from Algeria, all the way down into Nigeria, uh, who are here to uh, prosecute their jihad, as it were, uh, a holy war. These are the same guys who have been running um, the arms trafficking, women traffickers, uh, gun trafficking and cigarette trafficking trade throughout the Sahel, right from Mauritania all the way east to Somalia. So these are battle-hardened fighters, and they have all kinds of names of organizations. You have Al-Mirabitum, that is AMB. You have uh, Ansar al-Din, AAD. You have Mujiwa, Movement for the Unity of Jihad in West Africa, and so on and so forth. So there are many uh, hardened fighters who suddenly found that, uh, well, it appears Nigerians don't care uh, too much about their security. So they have found their way in also. So you see, it's a mixture. You have the Nigerian element, you have the uh, Nigerian um, uh, Fulanis, you have the some of those Fulanis from uh, these um, uh, um, trans, on their transhuman, transhuman trade, some who maybe have been dispossessed of cattle, their cattle rustled, and so they now say, okay, we'll turn to crime to try to make up. Then you have the core jihadists, who are just, their own is to prosecute uh, uh, jihad uh, forever, as it were. So that is what we have uh, going on uh, in this place. So it's a complex threat okay. matrix in terms of uh, who the actors uh, are. Now, they are, why they are acting this way, 
Some of them are just, just to get money, some to prosecute their ideological uh, agenda. You know, so there are so many uh, things that are... So many complexities, exactly. Let me uh, put you on the spot for, uh, again. I, I'm sorry I had to bring this sad reminder to you. Uh, you have been a victim of uh, abduction, and uh, I'm sure you shared your experience on many TV stations. Uh, so for the parents who probably may be watching or someone who has an interest and is looking at it, what is the possibility that this will not go the way of the Chibok or the Dapchi girls where we spent quite a number of uh, years, even in some cases? So I'm looking at what do we need to do? You mentioned the operation, is it Makama uh, that was used in Ogun State? Yeah, Makama strategy, Bashir Makama, so what, the CP. So we, we call that approach the Makama strategy. So putting that into context and looking at your experience, what's the possibility that these boys haven't gone too far to be rescued? Thank you, sir. Well, let me start with my experience. Uh, my experience was really an attempted kidnap uh, where uh, I was able to fight off uh, and get off well, I got some gunshots in the process, but I was able to get away, you know, eventually, actually fight the attackers and get away. And so, uh, and I, I have some scars to show for that. So that's that's what happened in my case. Uh, now, but in, in a mass kidnap, the, what this particular kidnap uh, situation mirrors is the Chibok uh, situation, which is a, a mass kidnap. Uh, Chibok started with 278 girls, and uh, rusted down somehow. Uh, so it's a mass uh, kidnap case, and then it's targeting school children also. So there are there are many parallels here. For example, at that time in Chibok, I said, why didn't we do risk assessments? Why didn't we know that these guys were going to come? Because it was so it was so predictable. Boko Haram had been attacking schools, so many schools. We had seen it. We had documented it. We had even called for the sack of then education minister and so on. But nothing, of course, nothing happens in this country, and not even under the previous administration. He didn't sack anybody. So, and this is what persisted until they went and seized those girls from Chibo. So again, here, with this parallel that we, we are seeing, we are saying that if they don't do this Makama strategy that I'm saying, go in hot pursuit or fresh pursuit of these uh, uh, terrorists that then we are going to lapse into the Chibok situation because they are going to say, okay, let's dig in and see how we can milk uh, these kids for a lot of money. Now, you know what's going to happen. Uh, unfortunately, some of those kids are going to get killed in the whole process because wow. um, you know, some people are going to rebel and uh, you know just going to uh, get wasted and so on and so forth. So we don't want that. That's why uh, in my release, I'm calling on Governor Makama I must, I'm, I'm sorry, on Governor Masari. Masari. I must go to the front lines and uh, motivate men to march into the forest. We know where they are because some kids have escaped and come back to tell stories of what happened to them. So we know exactly where they are. And then let the federal government deploy its entire arsenal. Uh, they have, the Air Force has ISR capability, in, uh, intelligence, surveillance, and RICA planes. Let them fly ISR missions. They have drones. Let them deploy drones. And then let us, we must march on the ground because the uh, bush cover, the forest cover helps those people to hide. But you know, with a large number, 333 kids, it's, so, it's going to be so difficult to hide them so very well. So if you have a few captives, you can secrete them better. But when you have a mass situation, it's also a disadvantage, it's a vulnerability for the bad guys. Uh, could it be part of the military tactics when the army uh, assured us that uh, the location has been, you know, found and uh, these boys will be released. Uh, is that a tactical approach or is something that we should believe? Uh, I think it's believable because uh, if, uh, if they are flying ISR missions, because it, it, in this case is much better than Chibok. This case, many kids got away. Many kids have shared their, ex, uh, their experiences. Chibok, the response time was very slow. In fact, the authorities didn't believe at first that there had been a kidnap, including all the way to Mr. President. He didn't believe at first that there had been a kidnap. 
He thought that they just moved the kids somewhere. But in this case of um, of uh, Kankara, we know that there was a, a shootout which ended up with a seizure of uh, kids. So it's, uh, it's, it's well uh, established, right, ab initio, right from the beginning, that there's been a, a kidnap. Because uh, one, of, one of the questions I kept answering during the ki uh, Chibok thing uh, seven years ago was that, uh, oh, uh, how can you prove that they were really kidnapped? So I had to give them what we call uh, the evidence standard uh, on uh, a kidnap case. Uh, you know, before people started believing. And of course, over the years now, we now know that in fact, kids were, a lot of kids were kidnapped and the Boko has been making a good, a good money, good cash out of um, trading them back to the federal government of Nigeria. I know one thing you will not want to say, we are always advised to speak about it on national TV that has to do with uh, ransom or not ransom being paid. But the, the relevance of that question is born out of if truly these are bandits, which are the common crime, which is the common crime in the Northwest, unlike Northeast, where we can easily conclude, even if they do not claim responsibility, that this was the Boko Haram or ISWAP or all forms of terrorist organizations. But we are looking at Northwest. Is this not a case of theft? Is this not a case of looking for something to have? you know, to continue the operations, what strategy can you subtly suggest to the security forces? Because we are, we are disturbed that, why should it take, we are talking about the third day now. This hardly happened in other crimes. We still have a, re a recent one where an American citizen was rescued. What is it about our Nigerian lives that uh, we can't get onto the issue f as fast as possible? Well, I think part of the problem is uh, uh, perhaps not uh, understanding what the threats are, not, uh, in fact, embracing reality. Uh, for example, even your linguistic Mutsa uh, is telling me that, um, you know, if you say Boko Haram in the Northeast, but the bandits are terrorists too. Okay. Uh, what, what, what do you mean by terrorists? Terrorists was not born a terrorist. It's what they do that is the methods they adopt that give us, uh, uh, that enable us give them the labels. Now, they are kidnapping people. That is a terrorist crime. Okay. They are, um, what is it called? Sacking whole villages. They are depopulating villages. They are uh, raping uh, mass rapes. They, I mean, they do all kinds of horrible things. Nothing worse than what Boko is doing in the Northeast. So these are terrorists, real terrorists, vile terrorists, you know, the worst form of terrorists, as it were. So, uh, so I think that's one problem. Once you don't, uh, once you, uh, let's say, bring a, a wrong understanding or you don't have a good understanding of the problem, you start applying the wrong solution. It's like when you go to a doctor and the doctor misdiagnoses your condition, he'll give you the wrong uh, tablets or, or injection and you will never get well. And that's our problem here. We have terrorists in the Northwest, but somehow we, we are reluctant to admit it. Um, and so we just call them bandits. What do you mean by bandits? Bandits are thieves. They don't, they don't, bandits don't kidnap people. They don't, uh, they don't sack whole villages. Look at that whole Rigu forest, it's full of them. They are attacking people in all those six Northwestern states, Sokoto, Kebi, uh, Zamfara, uh, Kasina, Kaduna, Niger. They have, look at even today, they even kidnapped Nigerian people in Niger and killed a cleric. So, I mean, what, what more do you want them to do before you give them their honor of being terrorists? They are terrorists. And so we should first understand that we are dealing with terrorism and then now get to right strategies and solutions to mitigate the terrorist threat that we have. Okay, because um, I totally appreciate the education you, uh, you put me through. But let's look at, uh, you remember the, the early days of the Boko Haram? We have different types of Boko Haram. We have those who are ideologically driven. We have those who will use the bikes and, uh, you know, loot shops and steal things just to, you know, a form of theft. So I, I'm looking at what is common in that region? What is common? We've had um, miners being killed. We've had them uh, do all manner of things that are maybe pecuniary driven. So I'm looking at 
please, how do we ensure that no life is wasted? How do we ensure there is no collateral damage? And something fast needs to be done, rather than just telling us they've been located and we are spending three days. Three days working in the bush for such huge number, there seems to be some disconnect somewhere. Well, um, thank you very much, sir. I appreciate that. Um, I think, um, yes, I, I, let me quickly say that this Northwest banditry first started as a pecuniary crime. It was just about cattle rustling. But because it was not addressed, it has taken on other uh, images, as it were. It has taken on other dimensions. That's why it's, it's deepening. Let me give you the analogy of that. Uh, a saw not treated becomes a cancer and can kill the organism. So that's really what we have right now. But mm -hmm. having said that, I think uh, in terms of your specific um, uh, question, we need to go in hot pursuit. That's the language. Hot pursuit or fresh pursuit of uh, these guys who have these kids. It, they cannot hide them very well. Uh, they are not able to hide them very well. And so we need assets. We need military assets. We even need to call in um, the international community. Let's call the good Americans or the uh, or the French. Let them come and help us fly some of their own ISR uh, flights along with our, alongside with our own and be able to identify where they are and such that we'll rescue them. We need to make a statement by rescuing these people that crime or terror does not pay. We really need to, you know, uh, put a finger, poke a finger in the eyes of these bad guys such that they will leave Nigeria alone and go back to wherever uh, cave they crawled out of and go and be killing themselves over there. Now, this is quite disturbing, and uh, there's a dimension to this kind of uh, um, schoolboys and schoolgirls kidnapping, and it's usually about the boarding school. And a lot of parents have expressed some serious doubt about putting their children in boarding school, irrespective of any part of the country. So what measures would you suggest to the relevant authorities to ensure that um, necessary steps are taken to prevent similar occurrence? Well, thank you very much, sir. Uh, the most important thing, of course, is risk assessment. Like I said at the beginning of this program, uh, you must conduct good risk assessments. You must know what your risks are in the operate, and that should guide your security policies and procedures. And this risk assessment has to be each school, each principal conducting its risk assessment. If you don't know how to do it, they can call my association, Association of Industrial Security and Safety Organization of Operators of Nigeria. That is uh, www.icin.net. We will give them free protocols on how to conduct uh, um, you know, security uh, service and security uh, risk assessments because we don't want any kid to be kidnapped. And now this is not peculiar. Now let me give you something, and I'm happy you are passionate about this, sir. This is not the last time you're going to see this happen. It's going to happen many more times. It's just a new MO. The, uh, mo, MO means modus operandi. They have introduced now in the Northwest. And they're going to start running that play over and over again. And that is why I'm saying also quite passionately that we need to find these kids and poke a finger in the eyes of uh, the, their captors so that uh, they will be blind and they won't see more kids to uh, capture next time. But anyhow, let me continue with the security measures. You need to look at um, uh, having a security and safety, um, well, security awareness training for uh, students and staff, that is school populations, so that they will know how to respond in the event of a mass attack like this. Now, um, uh, not just a mass attack, even if it's a stealth attack, it doesn't matter. Now, you need to put um, uh, air raid sirens in schools. Now, you said something at the beginning. You said that there was a military checkpoint not too far from the school. Well, if uh, an air raid siren had been put on, air raid siren is that one that, that is the air horn that go wow and keeps, uh, you know, wailing. If that had been put on, the military checkpoint would have known that there is, uh, is a school or, or there is a, a location in distress. And they will probably have been guided by the sound to go and give uh, help uh, in that location. In that school, there was a lone guard. Well, I think you identified him as a police guard. There was a lone police guard. That is hardly adequate countermeasure in that kind of situation. Look, 
a lone police guard can maybe just deter some people. But when you, in a case like the Northeast, where we know that this banditry is rife, or this terrorism is rife, to have a lone police guard there is just to invite trouble, as it were, because even okay. your vulnerability will become an invitation to okay. uh, threats, as it were. Okay, thank you so much. I wish we can continue listening to you more, but I think you've done real justice to this uh, uh, topic that we have just uh, discussed. Thank you once again, Dr. Ona Ehomu, for your insight. And trust me, I believe that the relevant authorities would not just, I mean, hear this, they will listen and do the needful. Thank you for your time again. Thank you, sir, for having me. And uh, we will take a short break now. And when we return, the People's Democratic Party voices out on the issue of zoning in preparation for the 2023 election. That will be up in a moment. Please don't go anywhere. <laughs>